Welcome to everyone who is with us live today and to those of you who will be watching the recording later. Um, thank you for joining the first um, forum that we're holding for contemplative-based resilience program at the Garrison Institute. This forum is called Possibilities for Everyday Resilience, a conversation with Sharon Salzberg. I'm Krista Tanari, Director of Contemplative-Based Resilience Project at the Garrison Institute. And just to tell you briefly what CBR is, a CBR project is designed to help those who serve others to be well so they can serve well. We will explore themes related to resiliency and well being, including compassion, contemplative practices, trauma and resiliency, healing, and connection. Before we begin, I have a few requests and reminders to everyone tuning in live. We've muted the sound for everyone but the speakers, and that's in order to minimize noise, and we ask that you keep your mic muted. However, we welcome and encourage your participation uh, in the chat box. Please feel free to type your comments there. You can also submit questions with the Q&A um, section in the menu down below. We'll get to as many questions as we can by the end of our session. Sharon will also be leading us in a guided meditation, probably a little bit more than halfway through our time together. We are recording this session and the recording will be posted through the Garrison Institute website and YouTube channel within a week's time. Please visit garrisoninstitute.org to access the recordings and view a schedule of upcoming programs. Um, Elizabeth is here with us on the call today. Uh, she also works with the CBR project and she'll be helping to manage some of the, the tech in the chat and all of that. So you can also privately message Elizabeth if you're having um, an issue, she might be able to help you with that. So as I mentioned today, today's forum is the first in our series for Contemplative Based Resilience Project. CBR is an experiential skill building program to help human and social service workers develop practices that enhance and sustain resilience. CBR was created in 2004 by Garrison Institute co-founder Deanna Rose and our guest today, Sharon Salzberg. So let me get right to the introduction of Sharon. Sharon Salzberg is a meditation pioneer, world-renowned teacher, and New York Times bestselling author. She is one of the first people to bring mindfulness and loving kindness meditation to mainstream American culture over 45 years ago, inspiring generations of meditation teachers and wellness influencers. And as a matter of fact, I had the great pleasure of hearing Sharon uh, speak and present in my life for the first time in June 9th, 1997. I still have my ticket from this conference that I went to, um, which, which was wonderful. And that's where I met you initially, Sharon, which I, I, I definitely remember meeting you. I'm sure <laughs> you've met thousands of people and probably don't hold that as a specific memory in your mind, but it's certainly um, your work um, certainly influenced me and I wanted to thank you for that. Um, Sharon is co-founder of the Insight Meditation Society in Barrie, Massachusetts, and the author of 12 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Real Happiness, now in its second edition, and her seminal work, Loving Kindness. Her newest book, Real Life, The Journey from Isolation to Openness and Freedom, will be released April 11th from Flatiron Books. Um, we're putting the link in chat for you so you can go ahead and um, order yourself a pre-sale copy. Uh, of course, I've read the book in full and it is an incredible source of, of wisdom. Um, and also just, yeah, it provides such a sense of, of warmth and connection just reading the book. Um, so in any case, I will put that link for you. Uh, Sharon Salzberg's podcast, The Meta Hour, has amassed 6 million downloads and features interviews with thought leaders from the mindfulness movement and beyond. And you can visit, visit her website, SharonSalzberg.com. So Sharon, it is such a pleasure to welcome you and speak with you today. 
Uh, so I want to welcome you here. And I was wondering to begin um, if you would say a few words about your involvement with the origins of the CBR project uh, at the Garrison Institute. Thank you. Sure. Well, it's a great delight to be with you all. Thank you all for for registering, for coming, or for listening later, whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, what year did you say we began the project? <laughs> that was really funny hearing 2004. that. 2004. Yeah, the years go by, you know, and it's it's kind of amazing. Um, basically, Gianna Rose, who was the co-founder of the Institute, came to me and said, I want to do a project of kind of serving people who serve people. And the original form was, we called it the Wellness Project. We worked with frontline domestic violence shelter workers for about four years. And within that four year period, we were approached by directors of shelters and supervisors and people like that. And uh, we were offering tools such as meditation, both mindfulness and loving kindness and yoga or mindful movement. Um, some exercises of really building a community. What surprised me, I think, more than anything to begin with was that these people were all working in the same field and they yet had an experience of isolation. They couldn't bring the stories home, not only because of confidentiality, but because they were so terrible to hear. They thought, I can't bring that home. Um, and they weren't necessarily speaking to one another and sharing resources and, and getting support that way. So we had a variety of programs um, that lasted for four years. And then there was this very interesting point, I think, in general, it was very interesting because we could have sought to continue moving on to the women, the children occupying the shelters, to perpetrators. Um, but instead, we made this lateral move toward caregivers of different kinds. So that includes both people who are like caregiving in their families, taking care of an elderly parent maybe, or child. And um, it also included all kinds of professions where people are in that role. I'm not sure the word caregiver is doing it justice. You know, these are people who are like on the front lines of suffering and often dealing with seemingly intractable systems, trying to make life better for someone. And even people started approaching us like saying, I'm a manager, do I count as a caregiver? I'm trying to take care of my staff and make sure they can meet these sort of intense situations. And people approached us and said, I seem to always be the caregiver in my friendships. Even I'm the one who's giving and not so easy or comfortable with receiving. And so we began to see the program in, in much broader terms after that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, you know, I wonder if you could speak for a moment on this um, concept of resilience. You had uh, shared something about a resilience that happened in one of your, uh, at an event you were speaking at one time. You made me mention that and just talk about maybe how, how we're thinking about resilience and how it's maybe a little bit different from what people might typically think about. Well, the story, which is actually in my my uh, forthcoming book, but without mentioning the word garrison or the term garrison institute, but now you all will know. Uh, I was at a, a you know gala, as many nonprofit organizations will have, like a, a festive event once a year to try to raise money for their programs and um, with speakers and music and all kinds of things, and so. Uh, I was going to be one of the speakers at this gala for the Garrison Institute and talking about resilience. And before I was going up on the stage, they just uh, put me at a table, you know, so I had a place to sit and wait. And the hostess of that table turned to me and said, I certainly hope you're not going to be talking about resilience. I was just at a resilience lunch today. And of course, I've been talking, planning to talk about exactly that. So I was sitting there thinking, what else can I call it? I don't know. Like, oh, no. um, you know, and it's true that the word can be seen as a cliche and it's so often used and maybe people mean very different things by it. Um, but 
I knew from my experience, say, with the domestic violence shelter workers or people in a caregiving role in general, that uh, there is such a thing. Some people don't like the term vicarious trauma, but there is an experience of burnout that is not small as people are in that role one way or another, personally or professionally, and that uh, we need to understand, first of all, the stress dynamic, which is a dynamic is composed of many elements. There's the pressure, the circumstance, the situation, say, coming at us. And then there's a resource with which it's met. And that resource is both internal, it's inner strengths, and it's having a sense of community rather than being in isolation, meeting this adversity or this challenge. And to say that we're gonna focus on building that sense of inner strength of resource is not to say we don't try to do things about changing external circumstances, we do. But sometimes we cannot or we cannot immediately. And to seek change from a place of exhaustion, depletion, overwhelm is not a good prescription for change actually in a system. And so we look at what makes for that sense of inner resource. And that is really resilience because life is life and we go up and we go down and they're beautiful, wondrous times and they're really terrible challenges, some abrupt and sudden, some kind of slowly building and then there for a good long time. Um, So how do we meet it? The problem with the word resilience, aside from being a cliche often, is that it seems to imply going back. Like I'm going to bounce back to the precise place I was at previously, but uh, that's a little limited, isn't it? You know, we're also, there's lessons learned or there's new strengths developed or a new sense of community. We feel not so alone in meeting this challenge. And so we're going forward, even as we are recovering or resuming. So um, sometimes these days I do say recover rather than resilience. Um, Although I haven't been in a gala lately where I was asked to speak about resilience. Um, I I like that sense somehow of the forward movement as well as recapturing perhaps things we had before. Yes, thank you. I think that's such an important point in the trauma and resiliency field. Um, People are speaking about this. Um, Some people call it um, post-traumatic growth, you know, and acknowledging that through the process, of of loss or hardship and then meeting it with one's new skills or with support from the community or with you know accessing resources or maybe even learning a new skill you know a meditation practice or coming into a deeper understanding of compassion through you know touching the suffering of others um, that people change people people transform people grow and so what's what is emerging on the on the other side is not simply a return as you're saying back to who one was but someone new um Mm -hmm. who is the same person but perhaps enriched by and you know um bringing new understandings and new resources to themselves and to others through that experience yeah i think that's that's absolutely right and there's also sometimes there's a reawakening of um, skills we had before or habits we had before that we're not utilizing because we're so tired or we're so busy or we just forget. Like in the beginning of every rotation in the what was then called the wellness program, now contemplative-based resilience, we would ask people to do an exercise, which I've always found really interesting. You can do it either journaling or you can do it just through reflection. And in uh, one column, because everyone was in the same field of work, we asked, what's the greatest source of strength? What's the greatest source of stress in your work? And sometimes that was a surprise for people and you can extend that to life if it's not so relevant for work. What's the greatest source of stress at your work? And it was interesting because sometimes it was a surprise to people, like instead of the horrible system they were trying to deal with, it was like bad communication with colleagues. 
you know, and that was just an interesting note. But in the second column, we asked people to write if they were journaling, what do you do for getting a break, getting perspective, being able to just like breathe, feeling free for a moment? What do you do? And people would write down all kinds of things. I think in four years of that program, every single person wrote down, listen to music, although different kinds of music. Some people had a strong faith tradition they were relying on, others not. Um, sometimes people would write down, I drink a lot. Sometimes they would write down, I get out in nature. And then in the next column, we asked, please look back at that previous column and write down how you feel about what you wrote down. Right. So if they had written, I drink a lot to get through, people would read that to themselves and think that could be a problem. Maybe I do need some alternative skills. And if they wrote down something like get out of nature, it's really funny. Like I took that exercise to a program I was doing with military caregivers, like chaplains and medics. And somebody had written down, I kayak, I get out of nature, mm -hmm. does amazing things for me. And then the next column they wrote down, this is a true story. They wrote down, I haven't done that in about seven years. Oh, wow. And I think, well, maybe get on it, you know, like <laughs> you can do it. So it's yeah. a combination of like knowing what has helped us, what has buoyed us up, what has given us energy, and also being willing to learn maybe new skills and bring them into, into the fold, so to speak. Right. And that's something that we explore in CBR is bringing, you know, new skills or perhaps just deepening of skills. And I, I think one of the skills related to what you said is the quality of awareness that one brings to maybe that activity that they're engaging in. You know, maybe I know I like to go out into nature, which I do. I love it when I'm stressed all the time. Actually, it's very anchoring for me. But what is the quality of awareness that I'm bringing when to that activity, when I'm engaged in that activity? And if I'm there and I'm ruminating <laughs> on something or having you know, thoughts that are unhelpful, then I'm missing um, the opportunity for that thing that I, that I love to do that could be a support for me. I'm missing that. But if I am able to bring sort of an awareness to it where I can see the beauty around me and I can take the deep breaths and I can get in touch with the sound of the birds. Um, now I'm having a, an entirely different experience that is very supportive and, and nurturing to me. Um, one of our posts on social media we put before this event was based on something you had in your book, Real Life, which was, um, you know, what do people do to have a happy day or a happy life, right? Um, and I was thinking of three things that I do to boost my resiliency. And the three things that came to mind, the first was giving up perfectionism, which is huge for me. <laughs> uh, second was being aware of my body, you know, my sensations, like what it is that I actually need physically and maybe my feelings. Um, and the third, what was the third? Oh, right. It was this, what I just mentioned, which was um, let no joy go unnoticed. So I have this phrase, let no joy go unnoticed. So if there's a joy, either externally or internally that I'm experiencing to just be able to pause and, and notice that. And yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak to that maybe a little more based on your, your wisdom and practices with respect to resilience. Well, those are beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, wow. And I think that that's a really interesting point that we all can maybe make a list, you know, and uh, in a totally heartful way, not because we feel driven or obliged, you know, just say, I'm going to try to put this into practice, because that's the important point. It's not saying when my life is better, or when I have a different job, or, you know, when my kids are out of the house, or it's like, what can I do today? Either what I have I done in the past, or what what can I take on as a kind of adventure? I think it's really important. So hearing your list, I thought I meditate every day, um, even if it's 10 minutes. Um, uh, I have a friend, Amishi Jha, who's a neuroscientist, and she's studied meditation and its effect on the brain, obviously, and on one's life. 
uh, in high stress occupations like military, um, high performance athletes, first responders, mm -hmm. people like that. And she says 12 minutes a day of formal meditation, sitting or walking will actually bring the changes that one needs. So I always tease her and I say, I don't know if it's that healthy to go for the bare minimum, you know, <laughs> but it's very reassuring. No one is saying if you choose meditation as one of the practices that you're going to experiment with, right. no one is saying you've got to do it six hours a day to right. see any result. So think about that, you know, and I, I try to practice, well, actually it's at least 12 minutes a day in, in honor of her work. Um, and that means sitting in meditation or doing a formal walking meditation. I also try to undertake a practice of gratitude. It's a little bit like you're taking in the joy mm -hmm. because I see that my own personal conditioning, my familial conditioning, my cultural conditioning is say to come to the end of the day and not think so much about what I have to be grateful for, but more what I have to complain about. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't show up in the way I wanted or this person wasn't really present or there was always an airline in my days of travel and, you know, there's mm -hmm. always like a phone service. And that's just where my mind goes. So it takes not force or a kind of violence, but intentionality. Like what else happened today? Mm -hmm. What's the good? And that makes a very big difference in terms of resilience. So as people think of gratitude as... um kind of weakening, you know, like if I practice gratitude, I'm just going to be satisfied with some terrible situation at work. I'm just going to be grateful for crumbs and it's not right. But in fact, studies show that if we practice gratitude, we feel that sense of inner resource, right? We don't feel so mm -hmm. depleted, so uh, deficient. And then we can meet situations in a better way and, and seek change. So I meditate, I practice gratitude, and I try to get in touch with when I am feeling something uh, difficult, you know, anger, fear, then rather than calling those states bad or wrong, to recognize them as states of suffering and realize that out of compassion for myself, I can seek to relate to them in a better way. And that makes a big difference too. That's wonderful to hear those three things. Thank you. Uh, so yes, something you said also reminded me of um, my friend Elaine Miller Karras, who is um, one of the co-founders of the Trauma Resource Institute. And one of her favorite resourcing questions when people are in touch with suffering or experiencing something challenging is what else is true, right? So to notice what else is true. Um, and it might be something good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another phrase that can be helpful. Um, and then also you just mentioned emotions and I thought I might um, read a quote from um, real life if you don't mind about that. Okay, um, so the quote is, um, we can give ourselves permission to feel things. We begin to view our mind states almost like weather. We learn to take an interest in our passing storms rather than feeling so threatened by them. If we cultivate mindfulness, we learn to neither grab hold of these passing feelings, identifying with them, nor push them away. Instead, we recognize our reactions for what they are with enough spaciousness to choose whether to act on them or let them go. And then later you quoted um, Sokni Rinpoche as saying, be kind to your phenomena, which I love, <laughs> love that. Every feeling is priceless. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak about how this type of um, cultivating this type of relationship to our feelings and awareness of our thoughts and inner experiences can contribute to, you know, a sense of resilience and well-being in our daily lives. Well, the arc of the book, Real Life, um, is a movement or a journey from uh, being lost in states that tend to constrict us and confine us and give us a sense of very few options. Like we feel trapped, not when certain states arise, but when we dive into them, when they overcome us. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, also when we struggle against them, when we hate them, 
or fear them, the consequence tends to be they actually get stronger. And so uh, we can move from being kind of bought into those states to places of much more expansion and openness and connection. But it begins with relating skillfully to those very states. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, let's say fear or shame, maybe something out of habits, very prevalent in our in our minds, in our experience, and it comes up. It's just going to come up, you know, and we can't blame ourselves for that accurately Mm -hmm. because that invites the idea that we should have been able to control what comes up in our minds. And I remember one of my very early meditation teachers in India, a man named Manindra, said to me, why are you so upset about that thought that's come up in your mind? Did you invite it? Did you say at 3.15, I'd like to be filled with self-hatred, please? No. But when conditions come together for something to arise, it will arise. So rather than expending all that blame, like I shouldn't feel this, I've been meditating all these years, I've been in therapy forever, why is this here? No one else feels this, it's only me. We develop a different relationship to that constricting feeling, and then we're free. So it's almost like the holding environment around it becomes one of kind of more balance, more clarity, uh, more loving kindness. And we can learn then from that feeling rather than fighting against it or being overwhelmed by it. And so that's basically what mindfulness practice is, is learning a different relationship to everything. And not just the painful feelings. You put it really well in your list. Like sometimes there's beauty there's wonder there's joy and we feel we can't go for it we think we don't deserve it or it's not good enough you know it's like could be better probably the story i tell more than anything is about the time that um a friend of mine took me in washington dc to see the cherry blossoms bloom it was cherry blossom season and yes um, you know here right now yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it came a little early this year, but they, you know, there's an area with a, a concentration of cherry trees and they all bloom at once. And that's called cherry blossom season. So, so we went there and I was just in awe. I thought, wow, this is so beautiful. Like all these delicate pink blossoms and there's so many of them. And then my friend said, oh no, it's past the peak. And I thought, oh no, I'm having a bad experience. This isn't good enough. <laughs> You know, two seconds before, I was really happy. But now it's not good enough. So sometimes we do that, or sometimes we're so busy, we don't even notice, or or we think it's wrong, it's selfish. Like, there's so much pain in this world, and maybe with my family, maybe with people I care about, I can't let myself just enjoy this. But the consequence of that, which I'm sure you know, which is why you undertook the resolve, is that we do end up exhausted or depleted. We don't have resilience because we just don't have the juice to actually move forward. You know, we're just overcome and no one is helped if that's the state we get into. And so uh, we develop a different relationship, both to painful emotions and to beautiful, wondrous experiences that also come our way. And the other thing we do with mindfulness, which was very important for me, was there's lots of neutral time, you know, it's like ordinary, repetitive, routine experiences. Mm -hmm. They're not really strikingly pleasant. They're not all that unpleasant even. And those are the times we usually go to sleep. You know, we numb out, we're kind of waiting for something better to happen. And uh, there's a lot of missing of life if that becomes our habit, because a lot of moments like that. And so we really have the opportunity through these practices to change our relationship to everything, whether it's painful or beautiful and pleasant or just in between. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, There was another quote from your book um, said that mindfulness meditation is designed to help us cultivate a ministry of presence. And I love that because actually in that example, you were talking about, you say a ministry of presence for ourselves, you know, to actually create that ministry of presence for ourselves. But then of course, then 
as you said, we're able then, if we're present to ourselves and for ourselves, to be present to other people. Um, and there's a really important piece in here that we explore in CBR as well, which is around um, uh, some of the nuances between um, empathy and compassion and not falling into what we call empathic distress, which is just being overcome by someone else's pain. You know, mm -hmm. that our natural tendency to sense other people's pain and to feel that pain, especially if you're in any profession uh, where you're helping others or caring for others or trying to solve problems, social problems, it could be quite easy to be overcome by that. Um, and yet, if we are overcome by that, um, ultimately, uh, we become less able to uh, help others um, or ourselves, right? Um, so cultivating this ministry of presence, I think, allows us to care for others and then be able to um, care for ourselves and then be able to care for others. Um, so yeah, anything you might want to add to that that concept, I think it's mm -hmm. so helpful for folks to understand. Yeah, the, the quotation came in, in the book in real life uh, after this little story about um, this chaplain, Kate Braystrup, who uh, wrote in her own book, this story about a time she was sent to spend time with a couple whose child was then lost in the woods and the child was recovered mm -hmm. safely and some hours later, but um, sitting there in the beginning, the mom said to her something like how great you were dispatched to our house uh, to kind of put me back together after I freak out. And she said, no, I'm here to be with you while you freak out, not to stop you from freaking out or kind of repairing you afterwards. And she said, mine is a ministry of presence, of extending forgiveness and presence and balance. You know, it's like a, a different space. It's like, all that emotion can happen. It needs to happen, but in a kind of spacious realm rather than getting all tight and constricted around it. And so um, that balance is very interesting when we're in a hoping, helping profession. And here I was, you know, in the book talking about, to begin with how we can establish a ministry of presence for ourselves. And so um, some of the balance in the helping professions is between say, compassion for someone else and for ourselves mm -hmm. or compassion towards someone and realizing I can't fix this. You know, I can be here, I can help, I can try to help, but it's ultimately not in my hands. Like I, I once said to this group of people, if only I were in charge of the universe, it would be so much better a world. And someone in the room challenged me and they said, are you sure? Mm. And I thought about it and I said, I am really sure <laughs> it would be a whole lot better, but guess what? It's not going to happen. Right. You can't force someone to make a certain choice, right? For example, as much as you love them, as they're your friend and as much clarity as you have about what would help them, you can't make it so. And so there's a balance there between all the effort we want to put out, out of compassion and realizing this is the nature of the universe. I will do what I can and I need right. it to go. And so there are lots of balances there. And, and one of the underlying principles is just as you said, um, researchers are looking at the difference between empathy and compassion, although we tend, you know, in English, just to use those words synonymously. Uh, in the Buddhist psychology, compassion has a kind of compound meaning. They describe it as the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. So that's like the empathy part. We resonate, you know, we're vibing to someone's situation, a likely situation. We're not Mm -hmm. imposing our view like I know exactly what you're feeling because we probably don't but we sense like ooh, I remember a time and sometimes it's based on that I remember a time when people were not telling me the truth and how alone I felt and weird I felt and very likely you are experiencing something like that in your situation and or I remember a time where I remember in my body 
what it's like to not get credit for something that I did. And here you are, you're likely feeling some of that. You know, so the empathy part is important. It's like a building block. But the compassion part comes in the next part of the definition, which is, so it's a movement of the heart. It's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. Notice it's not a movement into to burn up ourselves. And it's also not a movement to seize control and be the savior, right? It's the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. It's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. So I really do see it as sequential. It's like we need that moment of empathy. And I think we need, we see around us a world often without empathy and how cold and cruel it can be. So we need that, but it's not <clears throat> exactly the same as compassion because maybe we feel that moment of empathy and then we're frightened. And we think I better turn away or we are so tired. We just can't, you know, we know what that's like, right? If you're really tired and you're feeling overwhelmed and somebody else comes by and tells you their sad story, what you're really thinking is like, go away, please. It's like, we just can't. And, uh, or maybe we feel, I have a, a friend who is a, is a therapist and he told me that for a certain period of time, he got into blaming his clients, his patients, so they would tell him something and he would think, I told you six months ago what to do. If you'd only done it, you'd be a lot better off. Um, I'm sure he's not the therapist for any of you. Uh, and he's, he's past that now anyway. But sometimes we get into that state or we do get into that weird savior mentality. Like I'm going to be the one who makes it all okay by tonight. Or we have the compassionate response, which is the movement toward to see if we can be of help. So in that definition, there are certain things implied, like balance, right? The balance between compassion for ourselves and for others, and that sense of rightful limits, things like that. Um, you know, so it, it's a very important underlying thesis, and uh, it's very gratifying that there's more and more research about it. Absolutely. I'm finding that's also connected for me um, to the, the the challenge of acceptance, that accepting, you know, what sort of seeing clearly what the reality of the situation is and accepting, you know, what can be done or can't be done, you know, the part of something that I am able to to do or change. And um, you know, we often want to get get stuck on things that we want to do that actually aren't possible, like you were saying earlier, right? Like if I had all the power, uh, I could do X, Y, Z, but that's not actual reality. So really working a lot on um, acceptance has been um, a big part of my journey. You know, I'm wondering if this might be a good place to segue into our loving kindness meditation. So we mm -hmm. might be able to practice that together. Would you lead us in that, Sharon? I would be happy to. I just want to also want to answer one of the questions that came in sure. on the chat. Um, uh, someone had quoted me uh, from a meditation I wrote kind of combining compassion and equanimity is especially for caregivers or people in that role. And uh, somebody else said they found it on the 10% Happier app, which is true. Uh, it's also in a couple of my books. Um, I think uh, Real Happiness at Work is an older book of mine where those meditations appear and uh, Real Change, which was my most recent book until the next one comes out in a few days. Um, real change uh, is also in there. So if you're if you're not into apps per se, you know. Thank you, and, and we'll we'll meditation. post the link to that in the in the chat. Those two other books. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, so let's set together a bit. If you want to just sit comfortably, you can be at ease, close your eyes or not. However you feel most comfortable, it's fine. Either way. And in loving kindness practice, we tend to use as an object to rest our attention, 
something like the sensation of the breath. It doesn't have to be the breath. If the breath doesn't work for you, that's fine. You might choose a different sensation in your body. Just something that's already happening. You don't have to like seek out, you know, in an intense way. We can just rest. And in loving kindness practice, rather than so much centering our attention on the breath, we substitute the silent repetition of certain phrases. But it's the same feeling of just resting our attention, first gathering our attention behind one phrase at a time, resting. And the real key in all these practices is your mind's going to wander. Don't freak out. It's okay. You'll get lost in thought, spun out in fantasies, or you'll fall asleep. We expect that. That's just conditioning. What's really important is when you realize that, just gently let go and come back. So in doing loving kindness practice, even though we're reciting silently certain phrases, we're not trying to kind of manufacture a certain special feeling. The power of the practice is to gather all our attention behind one phrase at a time. And then we'll just see what happens, okay? The phrases are like gift giving, they're offering. May you be safe, may you be happy, things like that. And I'll use phrases if you have your own phrases. That's totally fine. If you want to use these for now, it's great. But those are the basic principles. We offer through the phrases the sense of connection, of care to ourselves and to others. Okay, so we'll start with ourselves. Common phrases are things like, may I be safe? Be happy, be healthy, live with ease, which means the things of day-to-day -day life, like livelihood and family, may it not be a struggle, may I live with ease, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. People sometimes say to me, who am I asking? We're not really asking anybody anything. We're gift giving, we're offering. It's like a blessing to begin with for ourselves. Just repeat the phrases over and over again. With enough space and enough silence so that it's a rhythm that's pleasing to you. May I be safe. Be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And see if you can call to mind a benefactor that's someone who's helped you. Maybe they've helped you directly or maybe they've inspired you from afar. Have you ever met them? This is supposed to be someone who lifts our spirits when we think of them. The texts say, this is the one who when you think of them, you smile. It could be an adult, could be a child, could be a pet. Is there someone who makes you smile? If so, you can bring them here, get an image of them, or say their name to yourself, get a feeling for their presence, and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Even if the words aren't really perfect, they're carrying the heart's energy. So they're serving us.
And someone that you know is struggling in some way, having a difficult time, bring them here. See what happens as you offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. And then we'll close with the extension of loving kindness to all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown. May all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, we have a few moments. If um, anyone has an additional question, if you want to put it in the Q&A section or um, in chat, we have a minute or a few minutes to answer that before we need to close out. So maybe I'll give um, Elizabeth a moment to also see if there's anything additional that we haven't addressed yet. There is a question in the Q&A. I being an inveterate chat and Q&A reader. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, would you like to address that one, Sharon? Yeah, do you want to read it? Um, sure, the one about resiliency and equanimity? Yeah, yeah. Okay, can you speak a little about the intersection of resiliency and equanimity and perhaps maybe just define equanimity for those folks who aren't as familiar with that term? Um, the word equanimity is a little bit strange. I know uh, it it usually refers uh, in this context to uh, balance. That's what it means. And it's the balance that's born of wisdom. So it means like having perspective on things. You know, you see your friends, they're falling apart. You have a really good sense of what might help them, not just because you're nosy, but you're smart. And you offer it and you're present and you are there and you cannot make it so. That last part is wisdom, right? You can't insist, like, get better. You know, here's your list for how you should change your life. Um, life's not like that. And so anytime we bring in wisdom, we're bringing in equanimity. Um, things take time. Some things are not even a one generation fix. I've come to feel. But that doesn't mean they're not worth planting seeds for. We have to. Um, everything changes all of the time. Or even that people are complex. I've, I've known people uh, who work very much as activists and uh, trying to make change in social systems. And, and uh, this one woman said to me, um, you know, I keep telling the story of uh, this woman in a war zone on how terrible her circumstance is and everything she's going through, because that is really important that that truth come out. But she said, what I realized is like, I forget in thinking about her. She's also a lawyer. She has strengths. She's educated. She has a community that is welcoming her back. And, and she said, I, I realized that my compassion was kind of limited instead of seeing her more as a whole person you know, with this terrible ordeal. And she's also bigger than that. That's wisdom, right? And, and seeing kind of the intricacies of life. So I would say for me, clearly equanimity, meaning wisdom, and the balance born of wisdom is essential for resilience. Otherwise, we're so frustrated and we're impatient and kind of looking in the wrong places. Thank you, that's clarifying. Um, there's two other questions that I see. Um, one relates to uh, introducing meditation um, to someone who's of the older generation who's never tried it before, but perhaps is interested in you know, what might be the best way of, of doing that, or even maybe perhaps you know, which, which skill might you, you know, or something would you start with, right, with someone like that. Um, another question, is around um, the 12 minutes a day um, <laughs> meditation. Does that have to happen all at once to have the impact that um, you know Dr. Ja researched or could it be separate? So I'll leave both of those with you. Okay, I believe what Amishi found was that the 12 minutes does not have to be all in one chunk, that you can divide it up. But uh, I think everyone has to see what's realistic for them. I mean, for me, you know, I do both, actually. I, I try to sit for a chunk of time. And then if I have a minute, you know, before a Zoom call or something like that, rather than just sort of waste my time, 
which would be very tempting. I think, let me just breathe for a moment, you know, and, and try to bring it in that way. Um, if in terms of introducing someone to meditation, there are all these apps and such. If you're thinking about a book, I will unashamedly say that I feel like my book, Real Happiness, is a really great, it was written to uh, either help introduce people to meditation or um, help you renew a practice if you have one. So it, it covers a lot of different kinds of meditation. And I'm pleased to say a friend of mine was leafing through it when it first came out. And he said to me, oh, you wrote this one in American. And I said, yeah, you know, that's what I was trying to do. Um, it being very so, accessible to folks yeah, who yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, it is a little embarrassing to be recommending one's own book, but it's Not honestly how it's, I feel. I, I will rec I will, um, second your recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> it is, it is excellent. And, um, I would say the idea that it has very uh, straightforward instructions, bite-sized pieces, um, you know, is, uh, is really important to folks just starting. Um, so thank you for recommending that. I'm sure people will enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then just cause we have like no time, I'll say that, uh, if you look up different scientists, like, um, Barbara Fredrickson has done a tremendous amount of study on loving kindness meditation. Yes. So she would be a source. And then you can take off from there to people she refers to. And what do I feel about the term empathetic joy rather than sympathetic joy? I don't think it matters. You know, like I went to India so long ago, I went more than 50 years ago. And so the translations I was reading were very old fashioned ones. And so I'm used to, used to saying suffering and not stress as for example, as a translation for the word dukkha in Pali or Sanskrit. Uh, I'm used to saying sympathetic joy and, you can call it something else if you want. Uh, it, it's just, it's really up to you. Um, your language issue is fascinating because, you know, a lot of these concepts um, have, were translated from other languages um, and have different nuances or understandings that are sometimes culturally embedded that don't necessarily translate. Um, but I think the important thing is, um, you know, each person is probably stepping into, you know, mindfulness, awareness, compassion from their own point of view. And um, sometimes people can benefit from exploring what a particular term, you know, means to them or how they can understand it and just do that. And it can be a very personal thing. It doesn't have to be a thing where we say, now everyone has to use this, <laughs> this term, right? Um and then we have these wonderful dialogues where we can come to a shared understanding of what we're talking about when we're discussing empathy and compassion and so on. Um, and so I hope we will have many more of these discussions and meetings. Uh, it's been truly wonderful to have this time with you, Sharon. Thank you for you know giving us your time. Uh, I see we had you know almost 100 people on this call and I'm sure many more who will tune in. So I want to thank everyone who joined us today, um, as well as everyone who's, you know, watching the recording afterwards. Um, Sharon, again, thank you for your wisdom, uh, your compassion, uh, all the work that you've done these many, many years helping people um, develop a closer relationship to themselves and to others, and um, for such an enlightening conversation today. Uh, so just a reminder, um, all contemplative-based resilience forums are offered free of charge, uh, but we do need funding to continue our programming. So if you feel so moved, please visit the garrisoninstitute.org website and you can um, donate there or become a sponsor. And also we will have additional um, free will offerings and free, free presentations. So be sure to check out our upcoming virtual retreat schedule. Um, Sharon, you have some additional, uh, you know, retreats and, and uh, offerings coming up soon. So one of them is with uh, the Holistic Life Foundation, right, with you together, um, called Love is the Most Powerful Force in the Universe. And that's coming up on Saturday, uh, May 13th. There's also a summit happening right now 
called the Living an Authentic Life Summit, which you are a part of as many other teachers. Um, it started yesterday, but I believe people can still um, log into that and see what's going on there. It's running through April 2nd. Um, so please check out you know, the additional links that we posted in chat and stay connected with us. And we do hope that you can um, join one of our future programs. We will definitely be doing additional collaborations with Sharon, who's been such a big part of our programs at the Garrison Institute. Um, and so we hope to see you again. Goodbye for now, everyone. Great, thank you. Thank you so much.